study. We have for subject tonight Bible study number 11, uh, being a Christian part 11, and it's subtitled, What Separates the Church from the World? And we want to study that tonight, and this will probably conclude the series of studies on being a Christian, and we've covered a lot of different subjects. We have tried to break it down in teaching these subjects where our youth, that it could be easily understood for them, seeing that they've not been in very long. And that's why the Bible says to desire the sincere milk of the Word. And things need to be broken down for new converts that they may understand it. And then, of course, there is the meat of the Word of the Lord that must be preached and taught also. And a lot of times we have to go into deeper depths. Uh, as with tonight's study, we won't be going in as deep as we normally do on this subject of what separates the church from the world. That is our question number one in our outline. And it's just one word that separates the church from the world, and it's holiness. That's it. It's holiness. And we know that God, the Bible says, is holy. I teach a series of studies uh, in which I go in depth on the different areas of the doctrines of holiness, whether it be inwardly or outwardly. And I title those series uh, True Holiness. And I ask the question, what is true holiness? And true holiness is making a change both inwardly and outwardly. And to change inwardly, you must change the heart. You've got to have a change of heart. That is as much a part of holiness as the outward appearance is. And it's every bit as important. You can look the part on the outside and not be right on the inside. And that was proven when Jesus addressed the Pharisees who dressed in the long white robes and to look at them, they look like the very picture of holiness. But Jesus said to them, you do appear likened into quiet acceptables or tombs. He said, you appear beautiful on the outside. And he wasn't condemning that because that was right. But he said, on the inside, you're full of dead man's bones and extortion. And what he did, he revealed that even though they were clothed right, looked right on the outside, they still had a wicked heart. And that is the very first thing in the doctrine of holiness that must be changed. And then, of course, there is, despite what a lot of teachers today and a lot in the apostolic movement want to say, and do away with, there is an outward appearance also that we must maintain as Christian men and women of God. And that's what separates the church from the world. First, we want to talk about the heart. Uh, as we said, that is the origin of holiness as far as the church. Turn with me if you want to go or watch our monitors. Ezekiel Chapter 36, verse 26. Listen to what he said. A new heart also will I give you. You've got to have a new heart. Nothing else matters if you don't have a change of heart. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. Now, to break that down, what did he mean when he said, I will give you a new heart? Having a new heart is having a new mind. When the Bible makes reference to the heart and the mind, a lot of times it, it's talking about the same thing. The mind, of course, is the intellect, and the heart is the emotion. 
but the heart and mind is one in the same. So when he gives us a new heart, then we have a new mind with compassion. God's people must have compassion, and with that, you'll get a brand new wheel about you. A new spirit is having a new motive or a new being motivated uh, with a principle and an action, a new spirit, spirit, a new determination with a new mind, a new outlook on things. You, I've heard people testify down through the years, uh, after they come into the church and get the Holy Ghost, even the trees look greener, and the wind feels better, and the Holy Ghost just makes everything better. It does. And we, we, we have a better perception of things, or we should have a better perception of things when we get a new heart or a new mind and a new spirit. And he said that he would take away that stony heart. What did he mean by stony heart? You've heard people make statements about people, man, they're hard-hearted. And what they mean by that is, that's a person, man or woman, that don't have any compassion about them. Compassion for other people. Compassion for their brothers and sisters. We must have compassion. Now, that don't mean that we are to compromise our doctrines and our beliefs and what we stand for, but at the same time be compassionate one toward another. If you see a brother or sister overtaken in a fault, you know what? Have a compassion to do, a new heart and a new spirit. We will pray for them. We'll lift them up in prayer. As James said, pray ye one for another that you may be healed. So if you see a brother or sister that maybe is not living up where you think they ought to live, don't talk about them. Because if you do, that's unholy. Don't put them down. That's unholy. We are to lift them up in prayer. Pray for them that whatever their situation is or circumstance, that they'll come to realize that obedience to God's Word is within itself salvation. And pray that they move and grow closer to the Lord and conform to the things of God as opposed to conforming to the world. When he said that he would cut out that old stony heart and put in a heart of flesh, just meaning you'll have a compassion about you. You'll care not just for yourself, but you'll care for everyone. You'll care for your brothers and sisters. You'll care for the lost, the drug addict, the alcoholic. You will care for all humanity. It will be your desire to see everyone saved. And never would one that has a new heart or new mind pray anything evil or bad upon another. Because those types of prayers, God will not hear anyway. Jesus makes it really simple when he talks about having a new heart and a new mind. It's called having the love of God. Mark 12, 29 through 31. And Jesus saying to them, they asked him a question. And he answered, The first of all commandments is here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thine soul, with all thine mind, all thy strength, this is the first commandment. Verse 31, and the second to loving the Lord, now listen to this, and the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, 
as I said. There is none other commandment greater than these. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thou shalt. It's not talking about the person that lives immediately beside you or a house or two down below you in the community. Anyone that has a need is your neighbor. Anyone and everyone is your neighbor. And we are to love everyone the same. And if you can, and a good way to measure your true love of God is this. Jesus knew. If you can truly love your neighbor as yourself. Now, no one ever hates yourself. In fact, you probably think more of you than anybody else does. We get that confused sometimes. We think everybody ought to think as much as us as we ourselves do. But it just ain't that way. Huh? I mean, it's the truth. You know, I mean, you're prettier to you than you are to anybody else. You know how you look in the mirror, cramp, you know, you fix this hair and this and yellow place, man, you know. <laughs> they ain't nobody loves you like you love yourself. And that's what Jesus is trying to convey and get across. If you can love your neighbor like yourself, man, it's going to be a better world. But what this world is lacking is the true love of God. There's so much division in the land and in the world today. Nations that hate nations. Peoples that hate peoples just because of the color of their skin. And you think about that. We live in times like that. That if you're of a certain nationality, people are hate you. The Jews are hated. The blacks are hated. Whites are hated by different groups. God never intended it to be that way. He didn't make different colors of races to separate us, but that we can all live together as one race. Because beneath the skin, there's only one blood. That's all. And we are the human race. And we are all equal in the eyes of God. There's not a white church, a black church, a brown church. It's none of that. There's a blood bought church. And every man and woman that is willing to submit themselves to the word of the Lord and are born again become part of that church of Jesus Christ. Now, this church that is to be filled with compassion and the true love of God. We have been called out. You've heard me quote many, many times Romans 8 and 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. We have been called to be a light that shines in a dark place. I mean, it's easy for me to be a light to you and you to be a light to me. But we each have our own lights. But we need to be lights to those that are out there dying and hurting, that needs deliverance and salvation, to those that need healing, that needs the Lord in their life. We are to be a light in this dark world that someone may see our good works and glorify our Father, which is in heaven, Jesus said. So be the light that God called you to be. If you're the light that God called you to be, then you're going to love everybody, irregardless of the color of their skin or their nationality. Now, again, I want to emphasize that don't mean that we have to compromise our doctrines and beliefs and our creeds that doesn't mean that we must still take a fervent stand upon the solid rock. And as Paul said, I am set for the defense of the gospel. 
we can do both. We can defend the gospel. We can defend the apostolic doctrine and still have the love of God about us all at the same time. Because if you're going to reach someone, it'll always be with the truth. It'll always be with the truth. We have been called for a purpose. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Paul said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. That's what we are. We are all sacrifices. And we assemble together to present ourselves to God a living sacrifice. And this is how that we are to present ourselves. Number one, holy. That's how we're to present ourselves. Do you know that if you don't present yourself a living sacrifice that is holy, that God will not accept that sacrifice of praise, whether it's a beautiful song, it's a beautiful playing on an instrument, if it's having a good testimony, whatever it may be, if our sacrifice is not holy, then it is not acceptable with God. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. That's telling us if it's not, he won't accept our praise, our singing, or whatever it is we do. He said, which is your reasonable service. Always remember, I've heard people absolutely say about this apostolic way and movement. You folks are too strict for us. You people, you people, man, y'all just live, the way you all live is just too hard. We can't live that. Well, that is absolutely not true. Because the Bible just says that it is our reasonable service. And he said in verse 2, And be not conformed to this world. What does it mean to be conformed to the world? To be fashioned like the world. Act like the world. Dress like the world. He said we cannot do that. We are charged not to be fashioned after the world. We do have to change our mindset, our thoughts, and also our outward appearance in order to be an acceptable sacrifice unto God. And if we don't do that, it is just that simple. We will not be accepted of Him except we abide by the commandments that He has given in the Scripture. And sometimes we can be preaching on holiness, the doctrines of holiness, and your people may see people make strange faces, and expressions, and their countenances will change. When all the man of God is doing is say, look, this is what has been given us in Scripture that we must adhere to in order to please God. And then people are getting mad. I'm not coming back there anymore. Nevertheless, the Bible says the foundations of God stand as sure. And it's not going to change for me, for you, or for anyone else. Then I understand that the young needs time at times to grow in this. That is true. But they can't use it as a crutch either. And sometimes that happens. They'll be doing something that they know is wrong. So, well, I'm a young Christian. That's not the answer to doing something wrong. Number one, if someone acknowledges that they're doing something wrong, then it's sin, period. James 4 and 17 says, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So even the youth or the young cannot use that as a crutch. Well, I'm just a beginner. I've had people actually tell me that. You know, I know it's wrong, but I'm just a beginner. And if you know it's wrong, I don't care how young you are. Now, if there's something you don't fully understand, in your mind, then maybe you you haven't 
a problem and you need maybe clarification or a greater understanding, and that will come. It will. But to the youth, don't ever use being young as a crutch to do whatever and live however you want to live. God won't accept it. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and verse 17. Paul says, Wherefore, and he's speaking to the church, young, middle-aged, and old, Wherefore, come out from among them, speaking of the world, and be ye separate, there's got to be a separation between the church and the world. And be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I've often said this, and the people here have heard me say it all down through the years. Now, everything that the world does is not unclean. And if it's not unclean, it's not sin. There's there's plenty of things in the world that we can do and take part in and enjoy ourselves by way of entertainment. I've always said this, church is our life, but we have a life outside church too. And we've got to learn how to live them both together. A life in church and a life outside church and know the differences and that's why Bible study is important and church is important that we may be taught the things of God that when we're confronted with things of the world then we'll know what is righteous and holy. So a change of heart is vitally important. Without a change of heart We are wasting our time. Second is the outward appearance. And despite what the the nominal world wants to say or teach, there is an outward appearance that Christian people must adhere to that is different from the world. And again, I won't be going into it in depth tonight as I do in our regular teachings on the doctrines of holiness, but I'll get my point across that you can understand what he's talking about. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, 28. And the Bible says, So God created man. Let me know what man is. Just, just as long as we understand the word in here. So God created man. In his own image, in the image of God, created he him, male and female, created he them. How many knows what a female is? Can you tell the difference? I hope so. You are exactly right. We're living in a time right now that you can see two walking down the mall and you don't know what they are. Huh? And matter of fact, they can turn around and you still don't know what they are. Now that's the kind of world that we're living in. It's all messed up. God never designed it that way. He meant for there to be a distinct separation between the male and the female that it would be or they would be Outwardly noticeable. That you should be able to look at a man and know it's a man. And you should be able to look at a woman and know that it's a woman. Shouldn't be any doubt. But I'm telling you, there are some of them that can go through that change, they call it, that transgender movement that's in our land today. I'm telling you, it may sound old-fashioned, but it's demonic. Ever been as much as homosexuality is an abomination, so is being transgender. God never created a man in a woman's body. And God never created a woman in a man's body. 
If anybody tells you that they are a man trapped in a woman's body, they're lying to you. Now, I don't doubt they've got problems, but it's not physical problems. Right here. Either mentally or spiritually. But I'm telling you, my Bible says God created them male and female with a distinct difference. Verse 28. And God blessed them. Who? The male, the female, the man and the woman. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. That's the reason that he made the male and the female for procreation, for reproductive purposes, that the earth could be filled with humans by way of relations between the male and the female and children would be born. God's preordained design, and that will never change. I don't care how much our government change. I don't care how much churches change. This will never change. There is male and there is female. The man and the man is to look like a man, and the woman is to look like the woman. And he said, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply. Two men can't multiply. Two women can't multiply. It's contrary to the very nature of God. And replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And again, the main purpose of creating them male and female is for procreation, to replenish the earth, to have children. Now, one difference between the man and the woman, I won't go into all of them. First Peter 3 and 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them. Speaking of the wife, the woman. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Give an honor unto the wife. And this is my point, ladies. As unto the weaker. Somebody say weak. Weaker. In order to have a weaker, you must have a stronger. You can't have a stronger without a weaker, and you can't have a weaker without a stronger. And according to Simon Peter, the female, the woman, is the weaker vessel. Likewise, your husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Vessel, and that vessel meaning is in reference to her physical body. And as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Now I want you to understand God created the woman weaker than the man physically. He absolutely did. Women cannot com compete with men. Going on in our nation now, they're allowing men that claim to be women to participate in women's sports. And they're killing them. They're bringing them home all of the trophies. You know why? Because as much as they try to change themselves, they're still a man. And they are still physically stronger than the woman. And a woman cannot physically compete with the man in strength. The man is stronger. 
physically than the woman. The man can lift more weight. The man can hit harder. That's right. And God designed it that way. Now, I do want to make something clear. The woman is not weaker than the man in the mind. Amen. Do you know they told for years all during my ministry that I hate women? They have. And one reason is because I do not believe in women preachers. I never have, and I never will. I have made this bold statement, and I stick to it. God never called a woman to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is a biblical fact, easily proven by Scripture. Paul said, For I suffer a woman not to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man. And because I believe that, they've labeled me as a woman hater. I just go back and say, Well, that's not true. My mother was a woman. And I love my mother. You see, God didn't create the woman as a weaker vessel to degrade her. But a woman is feminine. A man is masculine. Right? And there is a physical difference when it comes to strength. But when it comes to intelligence, a man is not smarter than a woman. God never created the man to be smarter than the woman. And the woman is every bit as intelligent as the man. I never got through school without a girl. Me copying off of her. Getting them to do my work for her. In my case, now there's a lot of women smarter than me. That's right. But I'm talking about the physical aspect of it. God created the man to be attracted to the woman. You young girls, young girls always know what I'm talking about. You actually see that pretty young boy. Man, they, they, they know what they're talking about. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with you. That's normal. God created the man to be attracted to the woman and the woman to the man. It's natural. It's normal. So he created them different. Their bodies are different. God knew what he was doing. God never messed up. To say that God created the man trapped in the woman's body about the birth is saying that the Creator God has messed up. And he don't mess up. And it don't matter how many surgeries they go through, how many hormones they take, it doesn't make a difference. On Judgment Day, they will stand before God exactly as they were born. Male or a female. That's one of the difference. As unto the weaker vessel, again, it don't mean any intelligence. So please don't go tell everybody, Brother Wolf has said men are smarter than women. I never said that. First Timothy 2 and 9. In like manner also that women adorn, and adorn means to decorate. Adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array. And we won't go into the depths of all of those different uh, things that are listed as to the broidered hair, uh, which is wrong according to Scripture, and uh, adorning with gold and pearls and costly array and all of that. That's certainly a deeper subject that we have called on. But I, I read that to show that there is a distinction between the man and the woman. And one of the distinctions is hair. Hair. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 14 and 15, Doeth not even nature itself teach you that if a man 
have long hair, it is a shame unto him. Paul was saying, even nature teaches that it's wrong for a man to wear long hair. Why? Because the long hair belongs to the woman. God gave the long hair to the woman to separate her from the man. In appearance, when you are in a long mall and you see people walking way ahead of you, and you look down through there and you see someone with hair down their back, then that should be a clear indication that that's a woman. And you look and you see somebody walking down the mall whose hair does not come over their ears, that's a good indication, unless one is sick or has a sickness, that that's a man. God expected us to be able to look at a distance and notice the difference between the male and female, and that's why one cannot cut their hair and the other one must keep theirs cut. It's God's divine will and God's divine order. It shows a clear distinction between the male and the female. And if you want to read the in-depth study of cutting the hair, read the first 14 verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 through 14, and it explains You'll have to use the Greek to do so, uh, shaving and shorn, which means to cut or clip the hair. And there's a message in that. But Paul clearly teaches that a woman is not to cut her hair, period. No trimming the edges, no trimming the bangs, according to his teachings in First Corinthians chapter 11. So it is that. Second, in closing out this study, it's clothing. In general, men and women are to wear different kinds of clothing, showing a clear distinction between the man and the woman. Women are to adorn themselves. Remember, we just read verse 9 of First Timothy chapter 2. Women are to adorn themselves in modest apparel according to the culture that they live in. Now, since... The New Testament does not give an in-depth definition of what modest is, which comes from the Greek word that means proper. Then we search the Scriptures to find what is or is not modest for a man or woman in clothing. And it's found, I don't preach law, I just simply use the law as a schoolmaster. Deuteronomy 22 and 5. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man. There you go. In every culture, there are men's garments and there are women's garments. And a Christian man or woman in whatever culture that they are in are not to wear the opposite sex's clothing. It is an abomination. Now, I had a fellow not long ago try to justify this scripture by saying, that means homosexuality. It absolutely does not. He is not talking about homosexuality here. There is plenty of other scriptures in the law and throughout and in the New Testament that condemns homosexuality. And these scriptures are not it. Deuteronomy 22 and 5 is not condemning homosexuality or being transgender. It's talking about clothing the outward appearance, and that a woman is to dress in feminine attire according to her culture, and a man is to dress in masculine attire according to his culture. So that is false. And they use that to try to justify that it's all right for women to wear pants. And I'm telling you, it's not all right for women to wear pants. No more than it's all right for a man to wear a dress. And if it's all right for a woman in the United States of America, in our American culture, to wear a pair of pants is just as all right for me to wear a dress. Absolutely no difference. And that is the gospel truth. And again, it does not pertain to homosexuality. When you study American history and in closing, what I'm dealing with tonight is in our culture, 
in the United States when it was formed. The Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights and all of that come together and we form the nation. In those days, men wore pants. That was a man's garment. Dresses was a woman's garment. And that has not changed because times change. Because the Word of God does not change. And that's just a couple of examples. The hair showing a distinction between a man and a woman. The clothing showing a distinction between a man and a woman. The woman being the weaker vessel showing a distinction between a man and a woman. So, there is a difference on this subject. So, again, in closing, holiness is what separates the true church of Jesus Christ with the world, and not only the world, but worldly churches.